So Jamie has um, been honorary, was honorary research fellow at Glasgow University from 1995 to 2015. Since his retirement has been working full time on researching and promoting Scottish history and culture, both within and without the academic sphere. And for to a lot of people here, he's as known for his live involvement in live performances of Renaissance Scottish drama, poetry and music. As for his academic publications, he's published widely on 16th and early 17th Scot Scottish history, music, literature, and religious thought and practice, including books on the poetry of Elizabeth Melville in 2010 and the Dunfermline composer John Angus in 2011. And his major focus since tw August 2018 has been Esther Ingalls. And he's given public lectures about her and introduced her to a much wider public in February 2019 in the pages of the iScot magazine. And um, as I said, some people earlier today in the 17th century Scottish symposium heard Jamie speaking today, but he's going to say even more about Esther Ingalls and a wonderful speaker, a wonderful topic. Over to you, Jamie. Thank you very much. Um... Right, um, some of you on the side may discover the picture down the side, there'll be occasional words of text or something missing because I'm not very good at PowerPoint and therefore sometimes the screen is very full. It's also not moving. Jacobean Franco Scott, Esther Ingalls, is a good subject for a talk <clears throat> to the Edinburgh Bibliographical Society. First, bibloi, or books as we say in English, were quite literally what she made, generally very tiny ones like this, often adorned with a self-portrait, as here. So, bibliographical. And secondly, she was an adopted daughter of Edinburgh where she lived from age three or four until her death in 1624, with a 10-year interlude in southeast England from 1604 to 1615, in which latter year her son Samuel matriculated at Edinburgh's Tunis College, and she came north with him and the rest of the family. Oh, it would be nice just to claim Engels as a Scot, tout court, but she wasn't, of course. She was a Franco Scot. In 1592, she herself said, or rather wrote, that she was the Francoise de Dieppe. Dieppe, port of preference for Scottish travelers in the 16th century. Dieppe, where in spring 1559, John Knox had spent three months preaching and converting half the population to Calvinism, his own very hard line, no compromise with papists version of Calvinism. 11 years later in 1570, the newly born Esther's Huguenot French Protestant parents, had they perhaps met John Knox in 1559, fled Catholic persecution rather than compromise. Esther was just newborn when they fled Dieppe. In 1601, she would describe herself as a Françoise, privée de l'air naturel de ma naissance, de mon fort jeune âge, et menée par de ça un écosse. This statement elides the fact that this Edinburgh bred daughter of Huguenot refugees and daughter of Dieppe had actually spent at least two years and maybe even four as in the great Huguenot refuge that was Protestant London before her parents took her north to Edinburgh. But Edinburgh was where she grew up and created many of her 60 odd extant miniature books, her livre. She was perfectly bilingual and wrote with equal ease and style in either language. Prière à Dieu, Seigneur à ton honneur et par ta grâce aussi, j'ai parfait ce livre ainsi, Seigneur, ainsi, pour ne faire honte rien au monde que duise 
ton Saint, qui, là, je ne sais que le dire, ton Saint-Esprit, toujours en ce sentier humain, assure, ouvre, redresse, illumine, conduise mon cœur, mon œil, mon pied, mon esprit et ma main. Which I have translated as prayer to God, O Lord, to thine honor and by thy grace also, I made this little book like this, O Lord, like this, in order that I never do anything on earth that is not led by thy Holy Spirit as I walk this human path. Assure, open, lift up, enlighten and guide my heart, my eye, my foot, my spirit, and also my hand. So be it. Oops. That uh, epigram skillfully employs the technique known as ver rapporté. All those verbs in the second last line, assure, ouvre, redress, find their object vertically underneath them in the final line. So it's assure mon cœur, ouvre mon œil. The final plea that God conduise in ma main, guide my hand to, shows how important to Esther Ingalls was her professional calling, her vocation to exercise the calligraphic skills with which God had endowed her. She made many livres, many little books. Those are not giant fingers. The book really is that small. And no, the page fingers were not touching the page. No books were harmed in the making of this presentation. She made even smaller books, of course. You may recognize Esther's self-portrait, if only because a different version of it graces the cover of this important book from 2004, although you'll look in vain for anything about her inside the book. There is good, exciting coverage of her in Michael Bath's recent Emblems in Scotland of 2018, the book which opened my eyes to Esther and got me hooked on her. And I mean hooked. Esther has that effect on people. She really does. But otherwise, modern Scotland has so far contributed little to burgeoning Ingalls scholarship not since 1865, and the magnificent notes on Mrs. Esther Ingalls, published by that colossus, David Lane, in the Proceedings of the Scottish Society of Antiquaries. It's true that seven decades later, Elspeth Yeo of the NLS co-wrote the 1990 Catalogue Raisonné of Ingalls' then known works, truly groundbreaking monument of bibliographical scholarship, which advanced our knowledge of Engels by light years. But that catalogue was issued in the USA as an occasional publication of the Bibliographical Society of America, not the EBS. Despite the color of the framework here with its delightful parrots and squirrels and the nice wee dug, Esther's sober black dress indicates that she was very much a woman of the Kirk, the Presbyterian Puritan wing of the Kirk. And that is something pretty much overlooked in all the now abundant non-Scottish academic writing about her as a female and a calligrapher. But the Kirk of Scotland played a major role in her life from her earliest days in Scotland. Her Huguenot refugee parents, Nicolas Langlois, or in contemporary pronunciation, Langlois, and I'll probably mix up the two pronunciations in the course of this talk, and Marie Presso, sorry about the signatures being pixelated. Her parents arrived in Edinburgh no later than August 1574. They were much helped in finding their feet by the Reverend David Lindsay, the Francophone, Francophile, and distinctly upper class minister of Leith. The family had probably arrived by sea from London. Lindsay had spent time in France and may even have encountered them in Dieppe, for all we know, 
Certainly, he was a close associate of John Knox, Minister of Edinburgh until his death in 1572. John Knox with all his Dieppe associations. We know that Nicolas Langlois and Marie Presseau were in Edinburgh by August 1574, and that Lindsay had signally helped them find their feet because they presented him with a formal letter of thanks for his great kindness and good services. It is the only ex extant example that we have of Marie Presseau's very fine calligraphy. The letter, with its poems of thanks, as you see, was composed by Nicolas Langlois and copied by his wife, Marie Presseau, who dates it at the end, Edinburgh, 24 August, 1574. That is the second anniversary of the horrific St. Bartholomew's Eve massacre of French Protestants. Think of Rwanda. Indeed, the second page of this letter comprises a triptych of epigrams about the massacre. And these are taken from a printed book, which was printed at Basel in 1573. You see the date right down at the bottom there underneath the false imprint of Vilnius in the Baltic. You'll also see that the title falsely claims the poems are by German poets. It's all done to dodge censors as far as possible. David, Nicol, uh, Ni however, Nicolas Anglais tells his editor, David Lindsay, that the poems are by French poets. And you can see the, the printed version and his wife's uh, manuscript copy next to it. And indeed, one of these three poems is by nobody less than Theodore Beza Vesaliensis, Theodore de Bez, the future head of world Calvinism in Geneva after Calvin's death. And no, I don't know who the others were either, N not yet. You see Marie Presseau's signature there and the August 24th date. All three poems are dialogues. And note how carefully the calligrapher uses two quite different scripts to indicate the two voices speaking in this poem. That had not been so in the print. Marie Presseau had done that in the first two poems as well. I think we can see why David Lindsay treasured and preserved this letter. In David Lindsay, the Langley family had made an invaluable long-term contact. Decades later, John, uh, uh, David Lindsay's son-in-law, Archbishop John Spotswood, primate of Scotland, would note that the minister of Leith was nobly born and a brother of the House of Edsel, i.e. a close relative of the ninth Earl of Crawford, no mean public figure in Scotland. David Lindsay was, as his son-in-law commented, greatly favoured of the king. Lindsay's mastery of French saw him charged with securing the conversion in 1579 of the king's French cousin, Aimé Stuart, Sieur Daubigny, and future first Duke of Lennox. In October 1589, David Lindsay sailed with King James to Norway and married him to Anna of Denmark. And then in 1590, in May in Edinburgh, he co-officiated at her coronation. David Lindsay preached in French to the ambassadors at Prince Henry Frederick's baptism in 1594. And he baptized two other royal children, the short-lived Princess Margaret in 1599 and the future Charles I in 1600. The last names godmothers were the Franco-Scottish Stuart sisters Da the daughters of Amy Stuart, Marie Stuart, Countess of Mar, and Henrietta Stuart, Marchioness of Huntley, while the two godfathers were also siblings, none other than the sons of Catherine de Partenay, one of the great French Protestant noblewomen. Her son, the Vicomte and future Duc de Rouen, Henri, and his brother, Monsieur de Soubise. To the Vicomte de Rouen, Engels dedicated a manuscript volume dated 30 and 31st December 1600, just after the baptism 
but fortunately this is in a private collection. So we don't know what she says in the dedicatory epistle. But less than three months later, on 1st April 1601, when dedicating the Proverbe du Roi Salomon to the Vicomte de Rouen, Engels would write that, Il a plu à votre excellence me promettre si aimablement votre faveur et assistance en quelque chose que j'aurais à faire, aussi bien en ce pays d'Écosse qu'en France. Worthy, this is Worthy, which indicates that Engels and the Vicomte de Rouen had actually conversed in Edinburgh. Edinburgh was a small city, the Scottish court was small, Rouen was in Scotland for several weeks. Whether David Lindsay helped the Longway family to develop court connections or not, he was surely involved in securing Nicolas Longway the well remunerated job of master of Edinburgh's French school. The 24th August letter to David Lindsay does not specify what, quote, care for our affairs, unquote, Lindsay had taken, nor, quote, what you have done for us, unquote. But the fact is that four days earlier, on 20 August 1574, no less a figure than Scotland's Lord Clark Register, James McGill of ne Rankillor Never, had told a meeting of the Baileys and Council of Edinburgh that there was coming to this tune, O oh, excellent learning, fair writers, and expert in the earth to arithmetic, who were willing to teach a French school and desire it only of the good tune a commodious house, male free. And as early as 3 September, the tune, the good tune, appointed blank Frenchman, writer, that he shall remain within this tune and teach the youth thereof, the earth or reading, write in the French tongue, arithmetic, and laying o count. And he shall have for every baron in the year 25 shillings together with 20 pundus yearly. And ordains Alexander Uddert, who's one of the Baileys, to enter him and his wife to his house at the new wall, the first term beginning at Mertemus, Mist. Now, the commodious house at the new wall was in the center of the city, down off the high street. It stood on the corner of Horsewind, now Guthrie Street, and the Cowgate in the southwest quarter of the borough. A stone's throw from the National Library's deep lower floors, and not far from the Institut Francais either. And it is where Nicolas Langlois, named as such master of the French school, was living on 8 July 1580. It's generally claimed in print that the Longway family lived in poverty until 1580, when Nicolas supposedly finally became master of the French school. This is simply because people have only looked in the index of names to the printed extracts of Edinburgh Town Council records and not hunted for French school in the index of subjects. So what the Crown's paying off of a £70 debt incurred by Nicolas and Marie in 1578 actually indicates is not poverty or poor relief, but the French school's standing with the government. And on 16 December 1581, the Crown conferred a handsome and ring-fenced annual pension of £100 on Nicolas Langlois. The letter of award elides the family's years in London, again saying that Nicolas, upon an ardent zeal born be him to the true religion, than persecuted most cruelly by the enemies thereof in the country or his nativity, retire at him and his family within this realm. The pension is awarded as a recognition of Langlois' achievements to date ever since his first arrival, namely the virtuous education and upbringing of St. Moni of the youth as were committed to his church, as well in the fear of God and good manners, 
as in learning, speaking, and writing of the French tongue, forming of their hands to a perfect shape of letter, and advancing them in all kind of virtuous and godly exercises, appearing to that age. As the effects thereof has kept it in a great number to their great weal and profit, and to the singular comfort of their parents, country, and common weal. The pension had a second purpose, namely to encourage Langue to remain within the country and to continue his virtuous trade. He did so until his death in 1611. Despite the Edict of Nantes of April 1598, with its guarantees of strictly defined but decent toleration for French Protestants, Nicolas and his wife never returned to the country or their nativity. They had done well in Edinburgh. Why risk having to start again in middle age and leave their family? They really had done well, you know. In 1588, Esther's elder brother, David, David, graduated MA from Edinburgh's Toons College. His 1603 Testament dative is not that of a poor man, very far from it. It's the testament of a wealthy dandy with a sumptuous wardrobe, an extraordinary collection of personal jewellery and a lot of perfume. David Ingalls may not have been a calligrapher as such, unlike his sister, but he could handle pens, ink and colour, as you see here. Writing as an amicus integerrimus, you can see that in the top line of writing in the genitive, amici integerrimi, of the courtier and diplomat Michael Balfour of Burley at a date as yet unestablished, David Ingalls describes himself in the bottom two lines as David cognomento Anglus, natione gallus et educatione scotus. English or Ingalls by surname, French by nation, and Scots by education. His sister Esther, who supervised the drawing up of David Ingalls' testament dative, also played on the punning value of her surname. Esther, Anglouis, Francoise. Her father had done the same thing in 1591, at the end of his little luminary poem to Elizabeth Tudor, signing himself <clears throat> Nicolaus Cognimento Anglus Natione Gallus Dicte Estere Pater, father of the aforesaid Esther. Unlike his dandy son, he was not Educatione Scotus. How fluent Nicholas ever became in Scots, we do not know. When he died in 1611, although he had lived in Edinburgh almost 40 years, um, he made sure the key parts of his testament were recorded both in Scots and in French. Perhaps he did not trust Scottish notaries. His little 1591 poem to Elizabeth Tudor is part of the rich paratext of this extraordinary book. Discours de la Foué, of which I've made an unpublished edition and translation that I hope to get into print sooner than later. The Discours itself is a big, truly excellent and dynamic catechetical poem, quite possibly by Esther herself. It sets out the elements of the faith, but in a highly militant way. It's not known from any other source. It is prefaced by her own lengthy epistle dedicatory and a sonnet addressed a sa majesty to the queen. And the sonnet indicates that the poem is by Esther, not the sonnet, but the, the long poem. The whole thing, epistle and poem, and dazzling calligraphic virtuosity, as you see, is a very diplomatic interlinear request to the English Queen, the champion of the true faith, 
and provider of refuge to French Protestants, that she upgrade her military intervention on behalf of the beleaguered Huguenots and their leader, King Henri de Navarre. That final 40th stanza of the poem is pretty explicit. I won't read the French, but my translation. O oh God, who sees our hearts and those of our opponents, take in hand our cause, make an end of our afflictions, strengthen our spirits with constancy and faith, and then neither the tortures, nor the chains, nor the bands, nor the whips, nor the fires of execrable tyrants will ever have the power to separate us from thee. The epistle dedicatory makes it clear, however, that the manuscript of the poem came accompanied by a something, a separate document. J'ai apprêté ce livret contenant un sommaire discours de la foi que j'ai écrit en diverses sortes de lettres et un portrait de la religion chrétienne que j'ai tiré avec la plume, lequel j'envoie à votre majesté pour l'honorer de la petite connaissance que Dieu m'a donné en l'art d'écrire et de pourtraire. That emblematic drawing must have looked something like this. A print which very rapidly spread throughout the Huguenot world uses a frontispiece, an emblem illustration, or a printer's device. But it was first found here in the Catechism of Theodore de Bez, whom you've already met. Esther Ingalls is famous for her miniature self-portraits, but the earliest examples are from 59, e.g. this one that you've already seen. Not the least of the many fascinations of the truly excellent dynamic poem Discours de la Foi and its paratext is that it gives us written evidence that Esther was already drawing portraits in 1590. The manuscript's dated 1st January 1591. It's a New Year gift to Elizabeth Tudor. So it must have been written the previous year when the Huguenots were, the Huguenot cause in France was in mortal danger. By the autumn, there were three different Spanish armies on French soil in support of the fanatical Ligue Catholique and the martyr's crown had been promised by the doctors of the Sorbonne to any French Catholic soldier who fell fighting the diabolical heretic Henri de Navarre, who claimed falsely to be king of France. In a note to the reader at the end of the discours, I love the idea of a note to the reader being written like this and addressed to one person, and that person a queen. Esther tells the queen the, the, that having drawn the portrait of religion, j'ai bien voulu pour l'exposition de celui, portrait, de celui portrait, écrire de, en dessous certain nombre de vers, les uns en anglais, les autres en français, ayant par la grâce de Dieu, intelligence des dites langues. This statement is exciting because while there are printed French verses associated with the printed portrait de la religion, I have not found any such printed thing in English. So the implication is that what Esther eh, is saying is that she has herself has composed these short verses in both tongues. Given her skill <coughs> displayed in her other extant verse in French, such as the sonnet to Elizabeth Tudor you saw a moment ago, I see no conclusive reason to discount her composition of the 40 stanzas of the really rather magnificent discourse, magnificent both poetically and, as you have seen, calligraphically. That was only a small selection of the types of, of script that she deploys 
in ever smaller forms throughout the course of the 40 stanza. The long way Presol letter to Lindsay is strong evidence for Esther's having received her early calligraphic training from her maman. Deux petits livres écrits à la main par Marie Presol were presented to the Royal Library of the young King James sometime shortly after 1575 by the royal servant and courtier, Sir William Livingston of Kilsyth. Presseau's link to Sir William Livingston may have been due to the fact that his son and heir was married to a French woman who had family connections to a Scot in the French royal Garde Écossaise. There were all these connections between France and Scotland at very high level. These very early long way family connections with Clark Register McGill, David Lindsay, and Sir William Livingston of Forsyth raise the fascinating possibility that Engels, as a girl, may have had access to and even studied with the virtuoso royal scribe, John Geddy, who himself had spent years in France at some point before 1586. We know that like many other Scots, Geddy had strong connections with the Huguenot stronghold La Rochelle, which had been a major refuge for Protestants during the St. Bartholomew's massacres, because it was impregnable. It triumphantly survived a huge siege by the Duc d'Anjou, the uh, future Henry III, in 1573. Now, Several striking decorative features of Esther's 1599 manuscripts to royal and very high level dedicatees, <laughs> such as Elizabeth Tudor, as you see, some of these decorative elements are found in John Geddes' Methodi Civi Compendi Mathematici Libri Quatuor of 1586 and to date have been found nowhere else. I trust you see the identical decoration from at the top there. John Geddes wondrously historiated majuscule E, D and M, they've been taken uh, out of the manuscript here to show them, and the first of his three differently historiated majuscule I's, which are not shown, all feature a domed building, which you, you can't really see it there. You can see it at the side of uh, number B, the, the, the D. Um, a domed building, which looks a bit like an idealized French Protestant temple, while the historiated M shows a seaport that looks rather like La Rochelle. Moreover, the city in that historiated D, um, here it is in situ in Geddes' manuscript, is under siege. There's a big fire. It's under massive military attack. Put it back so you can maybe see there's an army camp. There's a huge army attacking and the city's on, on fire inside. And the historiated M and the, the, the D, sorry, is turned into an O. Um, with like the M that you're seeing here, these are found in Esther's 1599 epistles dedicatory to Elizabeth Tudor, Anthony Bacon, the Earl of Essex and Prince Morris of Nassau and in Geddes Methodi. Not only is the leafy border round Geddes title page found complete as the border to the title page of the book dedicated to the Earl of Essex, but sections of that framework, um, we see one above the title there in Geddes' own thing, and this one above the dedication to the king, <coughs> Geddes' dedication to the king, they are found as dividers uh, between sections of Geddes' text in many of our scriptural manuscripts, not just those of 1599, and the M turns up again in her, one of her very last manuscripts in 1624. Now, earlier you heard Esther's little poetic prayer adieu. Being bilingual, she did not only play and pray in French. Here's written proof at the very end of a copy of John Taylor the Water Poets, literally thumb size, thumb Bible. 
which Esther copied in 1615 as a matriculation gift for her son, who, as I said, was going up to Edinburgh's Tunes College. Oh, thou, th that page is the size of a thumb. Oh, thou, whose name is greatest of all names, preserve and keep the race of royal James, that Britain's throne forever may be sure, oh, one of them, while sun and moon endure. Amen. Now, the words are not his, and not hers, sorry, they're John Taylor's, but she would fervently have endorsed that sentiment. Hester's whole life was lived under James VI, before and after he ascended Britain's throne. Her youth in Edinburgh saw major historical events, not just royal entries and marriages and baptisms, but also the triumph of Presbyterianism over Episcopacy with the Parliamentary Gowden Acts of 1592 and their undoing in December 1596 with the failed Presbyterian coup d'etat against the supposedly Catholic-leaning Octavians, the group of eight statesmen who were advising the king, not least on his catastrophic finances. One would like to think they didn't advise him to cut Nicolas Longway's pension. The attempted coup and its failure, of course, gave King James his excuse for cracking down on the ever more vociferous Presbyterian party and the ever more autonomous Kirk, the kingdom within his kingdom. And thus allowing the king to bring the Kirk to heel. From then on, James steadily reintroduced the principle of a royally appointed hierarchy into the Kirk. That is a top down policy as in England, for example, as a which comprised representatives of the local presbyteries, both clerical and lay, thanks to the existence of the eldership. Esther herself undoubtedly had strong links with the Presbyterian party, and that, that was after December 1596. The evidence is very plain to see. What you're looking at is liminary verse written on the threshold of, of, a, of a big text, limen, liminary verse before a big uh, text. And uh, these are poems specially written for Esther to adorn those four very important manuscripts she produced in 1599. That's three years after the king had started his war of attrition against the Presbyterians. The verse you're looking at was all written by Presbyterians. First and foremost on this page, you can see it, Andreas Melvinus, the principal of St. Mary's College in the University of St. Andrews, and he had just been deposed from the rectorship of the whole university by the king. He was the leading academic spokesman, or rather outspokenness man, for the Presbyterian wing of the Kirk. And underneath, his close friend and St Andrew's colleague at St Mary's College, John Johnson. And here you see the name of the third great Presbyterian divine who wrote praising Esther Ingalls, Robert Roller, first principal of Edinburgh Toons College, where Samuel, uh, where David Ingalls had, when David Ingalls had graduated in 1588, Edinburgh University. So close was Rollock to Esther Ingalls and the Longway family that he had stood godfather to her son Samuel in 1579. These three scholarly Presbyterian clerics produced no fewer than 22 Latin epigrams for Esther Ingalls' four presentation manuscripts for 1599, dedicated, as you heard me reeling them off, to major Protestant recipients, Elizabeth Tudor, her favourite and the, the, the leading statesman in England, the Earl of Essex, and his secretary, Sir Anthony Bacon, a great Francophile, whom James VI obviously saw as useful allies in, in securing him the Britain throne, and Prince Maurits von Nassau, who was leading the fight against Spain in the Low Countries. 
Each manuscript includes the same little group of poems by Melville, Johnson and Rollock in praise of Esther Ingalls. But each of the individual recipients of the 1599 manuscript required specific flattery in verse. In the case of Queen Elizabeth, rather a lot of it. Andrew Melville wrote no fewer than six epigrams praising the aging Gloriana, while Johnson and Rollock more modestly wrote her just one apiece. There is now quite a lot of published critical commentary, thank goodness, on Esther Ingalls because her work is so extraordinary and because she was a woman. The fact that she herself draws attention to, she says these books are, 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 will maybe appeal to you because they're that rare thing, they're made by a woman. But none of the printed commentary is by Scottish literary or ecclesiastical historians. When dealing with these poems, composed in late 1598 or very early 1599 by Melville, Johnson and Rollock, for the four manuscript volumes in question, the printed articles about Ingalls overwhelmingly note that these men uh, were merely distinguished Scottish academics. Note that they were Presbyterians at a time when the king was clamping down on the Presbyterians. And sometimes even the descriptions in the articles are wrong. Poor Andrew Melville is almost invariably described merely as principal of Glasgow University, a post he had relinquished 20 years earlier when he moved to St Andrews. And at least in at least one article, Robert Rollock becomes principal of St Andrews, a post which did not exist since the university had three colleges, each of its own principal. There seems to be no awareness of the historical significance of the presence of these men in these important presentation manuscripts of 1599, at this point when the king had gained the upper hand and how over the Presbyterians. But in 1601, Engels recycled verse by Melville and Johnson in three manuscripts, and she did so again in the manuscript of 1602. In 1604, she and her husband, the clergyman, moved to London following James VI, as so many Scots did. Now, of course, James I of Great Britain, no longer looking rather worriedly at the future, but rather confidently. And lo, in 1606, Melville and Johnson's verses reappear in manuscripts written by Esther. But then the Presbyterian poets vanish until 1624. This is surely significant, for these are the years of the eclipse of the entire Presbyterian leadership, persecuted, silenced, even banished abroad, or in Andrew Melville's case, banged up here, for from 1607 to 1611 as a state prisoner, with Elizabeth Melville, the poet, writing him two sonnets of spiritual encouragement while he was there. In 1611, Melville's released, but banished to France, and there he dies in 1622, whereupon Esther starts using those verses again. In December 1607, we'll go back now, Esther Ingalls, clergyman husband, had finally secured an English pastoral charge, a tiny parish near Chelmsford called Willingale, Willingale Spain, thanks to efforts made on his and his wife's behalf by Sir David Murray of Gorty a leading member of Prince Henry Frederick's household since the prince's birth in Stirling Castle, and a poet. Note the description, scotto Britain. To this man, Engels dedicated not one, not two, but three extant manuscripts, and there may well have been more now lost. There are indications there were more. In January 1608, Esther Ingalls presented Murray with a manuscript and thanks for his actions on behalf of her family in securing that pastoral charge. The substantial epistle dedicatory is a didactic meditation on the imperishable beauty of the immortal soul of David Murray, compared with the fleeting deceptive beauty of the transient world a lowly laywoman giving spiritual nourishment to the master of the prince's wardrobe, Mechtimi, 
Next, in 1612, as you see, well before Prince Henry's untimely death on 6 November, Ingalls had presented Murray with this sumptuous manuscript of the entire Book of Psalms, and this time with a much longer and even more didactic epistle dedicatory. And this thing has John. There we are. And you see, Murray gets his name in gold at the beginning. A third extant manuscript was given to Murray in 1614. Now, Murray is the only non royal dedicatee to receive more than two manuscripts, or he's the only non royal dedicatee to receive a complete book of Psalms. Moreover, he is the only person Eggles ever describes, as far as we know as her Mecenas. But David Murray was not only Esther Engel's special patron. He is also a link between her and two other contemporary women of significance in the Kirk in Scotland. Namely, Murray's sister, Maestress Nicholas, and his aunt, Annabella Murray. David of Gorthy's family was that of Murray of Abercairney, Perthshire Lairds, not grand nobility. The remarkable closeness to the crown came through David's mother's sister, Countess Annabella Murray, who was married to the Regent Mar. She was, Annabella, King Jamie's beloved Lady Minnie, his foster mother in Stirling Castle. Lady Minnie looked after the king from infancy. She also looked after the interest of her sister's bairns. David Murray of Gorthy's elder brother, Sir William, sat in the Stirling classroom alongside the young king and his own cousin, John Erskine of Mar, being shouted at and whipped by George Buchanan. And David Murray was appointed to the infant Prince Henry's bedchamber in Scotland. As a Presbyterian, David Murray would be allowed no place at court in London after Prince Henry's death in November 1612. He was forced to retire to Scotland where he published this, dedicated to the king. No good it did him. On his estate at Gorthy in Perthshire, it's a remote rural estate, he was eventually joined by his younger brother, the Reverend John Murray, a militant Presbyterian who was confined to Gorthy in the 1620s as a punishment for his unyielding opposition to episcopacy. And earlier in life, from 1603 to 1608, John Murray had been assistant minister of Leith, helping the now aged David Lindsay, man you've already heard a lot about. Lindsay, as an old man, accepted a bishopric from King James. I said he was the courtly minister. John Murray's opposition to the introduction of bishops into the Kirk was so militant that in 1608 he lost his job in Leith and ended up imprisoned in Edinburgh Castle, then subject to his first bout of internal banishment. But perhaps the most interesting of the Murray of Abercairney's siblings was Maestress Nicholas Murray. This is from the uh, statuary on a now lost tomb. Like Elizabeth Melville, Nicholas Murray was an unflinching Presbyterian. She was a dedicatee of this poem, a vast paraphrase in verse of the Song of Songs, in which the bridegroom is Christ and the bride is the Kirk. It was composed and dedicated to Nicholas, you see her name at the top there, by the poet pastor James Melville, the nephew of Andrew Melville, in autumn, you see it there, November 6th, at London in November, on November 6th, 1606. While James Melville, Andrew Melville, and six other leading Presbyterian clerics were under house arrest in London and forcibly attending what is known as the Second Hampton Court Conference. The bride, the Kirk, in Nick Melville's poem is entirely Presbyterian, of course. You'll remember that in the Song of Songs, the bride undergoes some pretty savage persecution. 
that is very oppositely applied to the sufferings of the Kirk. Just to bring Nicholas a bit closer to her, here's her handwriting and her signature. She's writing to her brother, I think, in, in the, another role in that letter. In 1610, Nicholas married Sir George Douglas of Spot, and she moved to London and to join the household of Prince Henry Frederick. What a surprise, where her brother was. Because Sir George Douglas was master of the horse to none other than the prince. You see how tightly tied together all this is. Tragically, Nicholas would die in childbirth only 18 months later in London, where she was buried. That's where this tomb was in the Savoy Chapel. Esther Ingalls makes specific reference to this in an eminently pastoral way. This, this is giving spiritual counsel to a man, to a nobleman, in the huge epistle dedicatory that she wrote for that 1612 gift of the Psalter to David Murray. David sang money psalms and played at their auntie with sindry instruments, and yet oftentimes under a sweet soon had a waif and heavy heart, as one he lamented the death of Saul and Jonathan. And rift worshipful, I did not think but you carry a wafy and heavy heart for the recent death. Oh, the religious lady of good memory, your dear sister. Yet as you hear the name of that princely prophet, David, there's a word I can't see. <laughs> say all say, tack his subject to ease your dolorous and grieve it mind. Andrew Melville, too, in a letter of May 1612, written from his French exile, wept bitterly over Nicholas Murray's death. You look at the third line there. Queen deflea macerbissimum mire me abitum. And James Melville wept too, telling Andrew in a letter of July 1612, that with her death, he now had no friends at court and was penniless. Nicholas, in other words, had been supplying him with financial support in his exile in Berwick. He was right on the border of Scotland and forbidden to enter his own country. This is money coming straight from the court of Prince Henry Frederick to a man who's a dissident, a political prisoner, a political exile. Nicholas Murray was also the subject of not one, but three memorial poems by the great friend and fellow Presbyterian of the two Melvilles, David Hume of Godscroft. And note that Esther Engels had been the copyist of the unprinted second part of Hume's treatise on the union of Scotland and England, in which she suggests that Scotland and England should have absolutely equal representation in Parliament and the capital should be moved to York to achieve geographical balance. We can maybe understand why King James didn't have the book printed. Finally, a third woman involved with the Kirk and associated with David Murray and Esther Ingalls, Mary Stuart, married to David Murray's cousin, the second Earl of Mar. There he is, and there is Mary Stuart. You've already met her, the daughter of Ismi Stewart. Now, we know she has a direct link to Esther Ingalls. She was French by parentage. We met her at Prince Charles's baptism. We know from letters she was close to Sir David and to Nicholas. Originally a Catholic, her sister, Gabrielle Stuart, was a nun at Blackie Lee, and her other sister, the Marchioness of Huntley, was a ferocious Roman Catholic. Marie Stuart had converted to Protestantism in order to marry the Earl of Mar, who was madly in love with her. He was much older than she was, but they had a very happy marriage. Her Protestant fervor was celebrated in the introduction written by her physician, Patrick Anderson, to this, the Countess of Mar's Arcadia or Sanctuary by the Minister of Falkirk. It's a book of severe spiritual meditations. But the Countess's fervor had been celebrated three years earlier in 1622 by 
Esther Engels. There she is, Countess of Mar, Mary Stuart, not Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots, as this manuscript has been catalogued and was believed to be because people just didn't read the words, they just saw the name Mary Stuart. It must be. Well, it's not. Why would a Protestant be claiming that Mary Stuart was the queen was de de distinguished for her piety? If you think what um, George Buchanan wrote about her morals. Esther assigns to the Countess an emblematic image illustrating Proverbs 14, verse 1. The wise, every wise woman buildeth her house. Sapiens mulier edificat domo. An image taken from a much reprinted French book, Emblème ou devise chrétienne by Georgette de Montenay, a Huguenot noblewoman written in the 1560s and dedicated to the Huguenot Queen of Navarre, the mother of Henri IV. Esther's own self-portraits are based on the portrait of Georgette de Montenay, which appears in the Emblème ou devise. It is a book that meant a lot to our Franco-Scottish calligrapher. In the original image of the wise woman building the house, the woman was the Queen of Navarre with a long Valois nose. She's building the house of the soul. And you see the pillar at the side? That's the pillar of faith, the pillar symbolizing faith. And the original French poem accompanying the visual image begins, voyez comment cette reine se force. But in, and in 1624, Esther Engels would also reapply the image, this time to Elizabeth Stuart, Queen of Bohemia. Here, however, as you can perhaps just about see, Esther has carefully replaced the word da, uh, ren in the first line of the poem with dame. Voyez comment cette dame se force. Marie Stuart, Countess of Mar, would in old age be a militant covenanter, like so many aristocratic Scotsmen, signing the covenant and defending the Presbyterianism for which John Murray, like Andrew and James Melville, had suffered so much. Some of Andrew's epigrams for Ingalls reappear in our last manuscripts, produced in 1624, as I said. One of those last manuscripts is a livre contenant 50 emblèmes chrétiens, taken from Georgette de Montenay's Emblème ou devise. Esther recycles the emblems and dedicates each one to a grandee, whether royal, ecclesiastical, governmental, or just noble. And most of them are English. Not all. But the prominent 50th and last emblem is, and this is what it looks like, is dedicated to none other than Sir David Murray of Gorthy. And it celebrates the unbreakable faith, there's the pillar on top, the unbreakable faith that defeats the ungrateful world and its malice, no matter what. Given, that J given James VI's churlishness, churlishness, Charlishness, sorry, in dismissing the Presbyterian David Murray after a lifetime of service to Prince Henry, this seems a bit pointed on Esther's part. The focus on faith, set of way o te sirpasan the mold in the poem, also takes us back to Esther's own Discours de la Foi of 1590. Had Esther lived to 1638, would she have joined Countess Mary Stuart in signing the National Covenant to defend a Presbyterian Kirk from Episcopal tyranny and launch the process that brought Charles I to the scaffold? But Esther died a Jacobean, the year before King James died. Whatever wondrous book she created during her residence in England, and whatever masterpieces she dedicated and presented to English recipients, 
she was the Scottish Jacobean. The Scottish Jacobean epoch begins in 1567 and it ends in 1625. It is a quite different thing from the English Elizabethan and Jacobean epochs. Post-1603 Scotland did not cease to exist. And it was a very different place in so many ways from Jacobean England. Yet Esther Engels, like her contemporary, the poet Elizabeth Melville, whom I mentioned, is with depressing regularity described in scholarly articles and books as being an Elizabethan, and indeed, often, as an Elizabethan or Tudor English woman, to cool. No scholar would ever dream of using the words Elizabethan or Tudor to describe the individual cultural figures or the cultural glories of post-1560s France, Italy or Spain or anywhere else except Jacobean Scotland. An epoch, a country, a kingdom, a nation, which for many non-Scottish scholars simply does not exist. Given the academic world's deep preoccupation and its correct preoccupation with the injustices meted out by history and the need for what is called political correctness, the need overtly to rectify historic wrongs and historic discrimination, not least against women. This wiping of the reality of the Kingdom of Scotland off the mental map of the world is quite particularly saddening when it comes to significant Scotswomen, such as Mrs. Amar, Esther Ingalls, a Franco-Scottish glory of Jacobean Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie, for that really rich, deep talk, which took us everywhere from the bigger European perspective all the way down to Guthrie Street, which, as you say, is just <laughs> from the National Library, and I know very well. Yes, you will do. Should I put <laughs> the screen down now? Um, yes, if you would, that would be great. And I will, we do have some time for people, if you, if anyone has any questions and you would like to put them in the chat so that I can relay them, that would be really fantastic. Um, but I will ask you a question. Well, I know I'll make a comment actually, and then I'll ask a question as people do. Um, I think my comment, I really agree with you about this point, but people, people cite P Esther Ingalls as, as an Elizabethan because they don't have any context for her as a, Jacobean woman writer yes. or a Scottish early modern woman yes. writer. Yes. And um, I think that's but it's very curious. I mean, they make her an Elizabethan after 163. But there is no context. And I think so. I think the work that people like you and some of the people we heard speaking at, in fact, the 17th century symposium earlier yes. today, we could did write during that period is yes. really um, necessary. I the question I would ask you, yeah, was somebody who transcribes texts, particularly Psalms, and as you you really situated her in this context, which is very um, public and mm -hmm. linked to the political side of religion. How do we find in that the spirituality underneath that? Well, if you read those two epistles dedicatory to David Murray. Um, especially when one of them is a thing about communion. So that's not specifically the Psalms, but the long preface to the Psalms to David Murray, but also her prefaces to the Psalms she presents to Prince Henry Frederick, a, a set in French and a set in, in, uh, in English, and to Prince Charles, but she recycles a lot of the material from the Henry Frederick thing. Um, there's a lot, they're spiritual, they're not political. These are deeply, deeply spiritual readings of the Psalms. Um, and I wonder if these people would have been capable of seeing the world in a non-spiritual way. I mean, for them, this was the whole point of the covenant of the Presbyterian resistance. The Presbyterian resistance wasn't the English parliamentary resistance. It, it wasn't about um, money and, and you know, th those kind of things. And, 
revocations of land grants and so on. For the, for the ordinary believers, it may have been for the Scottish nobility, um, but for ordinary believers, no, it was about the truth of the gospel and Presbyterians could not find royally appointed bishops in the gospel. So this is a spiritual kind of, I mean, to us nowadays, it looks like a spiritualizing of politics. You know, and, and a lot of people today would say, yeah, they wanted to impose a theocracy. But, you know, if they believed in God, I mean, as, as people do in countries that, that we think of as theocratic, some of the people do anyway, I'm not going to defend the modern theocracies uh, like the like Daesh, to name one horror, or, or the Taliban. Um, but, but those people don't see the contradiction. Yeah. So... Um, I think it's more about us trying to find that because yeah. I mean Alist Alistair MacDonald yesterday in, the, in, in, in his opening um, marvellous opening keynote to the 17th century Scottish Literature Conference, Alistair made the point very trenchantly that a great deal of 17th century Scottish writing, great writing, is about religion. We don't like religion in the 21st century, you know, and Alistair basically said tough it's what people wrote about, and if you want to write about them, you need to come, you need to appreciate how real and important this was to them. He said it much better than that, but I can't remember who he said. There are a couple of questions in the chat. The first one I can actually answer myself because it is from Anna Groundwater who asks, is the National Library of Scotland giving Esther a celebration in 2024? And Ooh. um in case anybody doesn't know, I'm the head of Rare Books, Maps and Music at the National Library of Scotland, and I have been involved in writing a pitch to our public programmes, people saying we've got to do something. But as you can imagine, it's very difficult at the moment to work out what we will be able to do because our exhibition programme, like so many other things in this world, has been slightly skewed by the events of the past few years. And so things which we had scheduled, we have to move and so we will definitely be doing something. I don't know what. I know some other people, including people on attending this talk, have plans as well. So do you feel free to use the chat box to mention anything that anyone is planning or any connections you would like to make? Absolutely. Yes. And I know, yes, Jamie's also, um, I know you're interested in making sure this anniversary is marked as we oh, absolutely are. Yes. Um, I have a question from Kieran Jones. Are there any interesting comparisons to be made between Esther Ingalls and Elizabeth Melville's poetry, for instance, in themes, style, and so on? Yes, there are. There are, Kieran. Um, there's not an awful lot of Esther's poetry. I mean, that there's this, the Discours de la Foué is 40 stanzas. I was going to say there's not a lot, but of course there is quite a lot. The, the whole Contemptus Mundi, the, the Calvinist extreme Augustinism, turning away from the world because the world is inherently evil, it's fallen. Um, she made the, the wonderful verse translations of the Octonaire sur la vanité inconstance du monde, of Antoine de la Roche uh, Chant Dieu. And um, those are in, in Scots. And yes, there are things in there that instantly make you think of many lines and uh, of, of Elizabeth Melville. There's one very curious connection. There's a magnificent sonnet um, addressed to Esther Ingalls. It's an anagram of her name, and the anagram is referring to verse, uh, chapter four, verse seven of the epistle of James. And it incorporates a bit about the armor of faith from Ephesians as well, which is a great favorite of Esther Ingalls. Um, uh, and a great favorite of uh, Elizabeth Melville as well. She uses it in many uh, different poems. And there's another quotation from James 4, 8 as well, draw, draw near to God and he will draw near again. That's one of the lines of the sonnet. Now, the sonnet is signed by a GD that has so far proved absolutely impossible to identify. There was a guy called George Douglas who made a translation of um, Boethius, which is not known. It might have been him. He was a friend of David Hume of Godscroft. That's why I know he existed. Um, but if there weren't any initials at the end of this song to Esther Engels, I would be absolutely convinced it was a sonnet by Elizabeth Melville. 
So it's very much the same world. Um, it's something that I've been writing about and publishing about, um, the Melville Circle in the East New, because a kind of spiritual, virtual spiritual community. It's not people living in a monastery or anything, but it's people who um, get together regularly uh, to worship and to pray and to listen to sermons and so on, and they exchange things, and they also exchange poetry. Um, some of the, the lay people write poetry, and a lot of the ministers write poetry, and this is, some of it's printed, some of it's just circulated in manuscript. And that sonnet to Esther Ingalls, the, the, the anagram is fabulous. Resisting hell. And she says, resisting hell, you'll get to heaven by resisting it. And that's resist the deal and he will flee from you in James uh, 4, 7. I'm conscious of the time, much as I'm sure we would all love to keep talking. So I will simply ask the final few questions in the chat. Yes, absolutely, yes. First is, um, where are we? Georgiana says, if you're interested in going to do something at the National Library, I'm sure the Folger would be interested in participating in anything. Hey! Well, we, all, we, we will definitely be keeping in touch about it. <laughs> um, I think um, as in the next few years, as we all psych ourselves up for this. Great. Anniversary. Um, Anna Grindwater says a prosopography of this circle, I guess the Elizabeth, the Jane, the Melville circle would be fascinating. I'd love a visualization of it to keep track of it. And okay. that's what I was thinking while Jamie was talking as well. It would make a lovely chart um, that I, th I think is graphical representations to keep these connections. Well, no, I agree. And I'll get lessons in that from Chris Langley, who's setting up this fantastic map in the Scottish parish. I mean, he now, he's not doing it on his own, of course, he's doing it with Mickey Brock, and uh, they know all about mapping. Yep. And one final question from Derek Taylor, our secretary. Mm -hmm. Esther learned calligraphy from her mother, who taught her to make the actual miniature books? And did she make them herself? Yes, we're pretty certain that she made them herself. Um, some of them, uh, often in these talks, I <coughs> use an illustration or two to show the beautiful covers that she created um, for royalty, for Prince Henry, for Prince Charles, for the king himself. There's one in the National Library for the king with a phoenix on it's a beautiful thing. Um, well, the reason we think she made them herself, Derek, is that one of the poems that's by Johnson, I think, talks about how good she is with the needle, not, not, not just the pen. Now, it could be a needle pricking holes in the paper before she draws the wonderful flowers around it, but I don't think that's, that, that, that's what it is. Um, otherwise, I would be at a complete loss if she didn't make them herself. I can well imagine it would be something if you were involved in, in bookmaking, in, in copying such tiny manuscripts, you would make, the, you would bind them yourself because they would be so priceless. You wouldn't really want the stuff to get into anybody else's hands. But I'm not a specialist on, on things like that, I'm afraid. Thank you, Jamie. We really do have to stop. I wish we could yeah. keep going. So I will once again thank you for this truly splendid talk. I would thank encourage you. people, use your little reaction buttons to signal oh. your appreciation. Um, and I'll just mention before we close the meeting, our next event is on the 25th of March. Again, it will be on Zoom, slightly different to this one. Um, first of all, we'll have to have our annual business meeting at half past five. Um, anyone who's ever been to our business meeting knows they're very brief and after that much more excitingly at six o'clock Dr Joseph Marshall former president of our society will be speaking about the special collections of the future and again it's open to everybody you don't have to be a member uh, of the society to attend our talks but I would really encourage you to join us and um, before I close, somebody's asked, will this talk be available publicly? We'll review, we're, we're hoping it will be, we'll review it and see if there are any technical issues, but um, hopefully it'll be on our YouTube channel. And without further ado, I will once again say thank you to Jamie and have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for showing an interest in this wonderful woman. Thank you. Thank you.